you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we want to look, as I've mentioned, at this very important subject, very personal subject, the death of deaths. There is a famous old story of one of the early church martyrs who was tried because of his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was sentenced to death to be burned at the stake. And as he was brought out by the Roman authorities to be put to death because of his belief, because of his Christian faith, all the people listened to hear, what's he going to say? What's his last words going to be? Is he going to curse those who are killing him? Or is he going to say something more encouraging to all those around him. And as that old believer was tied to the stake, he shouted out just three words. Can you guess what the three words were? He shouted out these three words. He is risen. He is risen. And after he said these three words from the great crowd that had gathered to see his death and from the hills around the town that he was being martyred in came the reply from all of his fellow Christians and they shouted out this he is risen indeed indeed and that became a greeting of the early Christians Every time a Christian would meet another Christian, they would say this, He is risen. And the reply would be, He is risen indeed. Now, I know in Singapore we ask, Have you eaten your dinner? We tend to think of our stomachs, not of our spiritual salvation. Chubalama, huh? But no, what they said, the early Christians, was, He is risen. He's risen. That's how they greeted one another. You see, they understood something about the resurrection of Christ. They understood this, that the resurrection of Christ is central to the hope of Christianity. No other religion on this earth has a founder who has risen from the dead. No other religion. There are plenty of religious prophets and gurus who've come into this world and come up with their own form of belief and use the sword or use persuasion to get people to buy into that system of belief. But there came a point in time where that person died. And you can go today to their tomb. And you just find, if you find anything, just a few old bones representing where their life once was. But if you make your way to a tomb outside the city of Jerusalem, a number of us have actually gone there. You'll go to a tomb where there's no, great, there's no body in the tomb. You'll go to a tomb where you'll see this sign over the door of the tomb. He is risen. He is risen. Because the Lord Jesus Christ unlike any other religion, unlike any other faith, rose from the dead. And he did it for a very important reason. And one of the reasons he did it was to conquer death for you and for me. He was going to become the first fruits. What's the first fruits? The foundation, the first one to set the standard that you and I can partake of who follow him into the grave. Now, why is Christ's death so significant? Here's why it's so significant. Because there are three questions that you and I have to understand in life. Here's the three questions. Question number one, where did I come from? Where did I come from? That's an important question, isn't it? Question two, why am I here in this world? That's also a very important question to think about, isn't it? 
And a third question, probably the, the most important of all the three questions, is this one. Where am I going after I die? Three questions that really sum up your life and my life, and you need to know answers to those three questions. In fact, you can't really live life properly on earth unless you have answers to those three questions. Unfortunately, for most people, they, they never think about those three questions or very rarely think about those three questions. They focus on what job will I get? What qualifications will I get? Who will I marry? How will I prepare for my retirement? How will I prepare for my children's education? Now, those are important questions, but they're not the most important questions. They're not the most fundamental questions that you and I must think about and have answers to. And why is the third one the most troublesome? Here's why the third question is the most troublesome. The first two, we're already here, aren't we? Whether we know why we're here or how we came into existence, we just know that we're here. But the third one troubles us the most because we don't know where we're going. It's so uncertain, this concept, eternity. Death is the great unknown. And someone has put it this way, you are not ready to live life unless you're ready to face death. I think that's a good statement, isn't it? You're never ready to truly live life on earth until you're first ready to face death. Now, the problem of death and the fear of death strikes fear into the heart of every man, every woman, every boy even, and every girl. This fear, what is this subject called death? What happens? Frankly, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, it should frighten you. It should worry you. It should make you have sleepless nights. The thought of eternity, the thought of death and where you will go after you die. Many centuries ago, we had a king in England. It wasn't a very good king called Henry VIII. And Henry VIII was so frightened of death that he passed a law in England banishing anyone mentioning the subject. As if by banishing the law, you could do away with death. Banishing the talk about death would end death. It didn't. But he was so fearful. And you know, here's the interesting thing about mankind. Man is the only creature who knows he will die. You ever thought about that? The only one. You don't see the giraffe in the zoo panicking over death, do you? You don't see the elephants going to the temple or the mosque or the church and coming to the pastors or the imams and saying, could you tell me how to deal with this fear of death? No man is the only creature who knows he is going to die. And here's the great irony. We know we're going to die, unlike the other animals. But we're desperately trying to forget it. Have you noticed that? We're desperately trying to banish this thought from our mind. Well, I want you to just notice a few things from this passage. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's one verse that I want you to focus on today. It says in verse 26, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Is death. Here's the first thing I want you to see this afternoon. Number one, the reality of death. The reality of death. Death is a real fact in your life and in my life. It's a very personal thing. It not only afflicts those around us, but it's something that afflicts us. When I was growing up, there used to be this little expression, I think it was by Mark Twain. He said, the only two things that you can be absolutely certain of, he said, death and taxes. Death and taxes. Well, to be really accurate, there's only really one thing you can be sure of. You might not live long enough to pay any taxes. Or you might be a tax dodger and get away without paying any taxes. 
There's only one thing that you can be absolutely sure if you're born into this world is that you will die. And as old George Bernard Shaw humorously quipped one day, he said this, the statistics on death are very impressive. 10 out of 10 people die. Have you noticed that? There are no loopholes. There are no exceptions. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter if you're poor or wealthy. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor. It doesn't matter if you're a nurse. It doesn't matter if you're a scientist. 10 out of 10 people die. It's a great equalizer of humanity, isn't it? We all meet in the graveyard. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter what century you were born. And if I was just to go around this room and ask this simple question, it would just show you how powerful death is. If I was to simply ask you this question, do you know someone in Singapore who's 150 years of age? Yes or no? No. Has anyone here in this room met their great, great, great grandfather? The answer is very simple. No. Why? Because death impacts all of humanity. No one lives long enough on this earth to even reach such an age in our lifetimes. That's why our great-great-grandparents don't exist on earth anymore. And it doesn't matter, let me say this, and I see the newspaper adverts and I see the things on the internet. It doesn't matter if you pop all the vitamins you can buy. It doesn't matter if you avoid all those unhealthy foods at the food court. It doesn't matter if you get on your bicycle and cycle for 25 km every day. And eat plain rice and drink water, green vegetables. It doesn't matter what you do. Can't escape death. Can't escape you. Oh, yes, you might put it off for a few years. But sooner or later, your name will be placed in the newspaper obituary. And the little yellow curtains will be raised outside your block for your vigil service. Ten out of ten people, it runs in families. Your heartbeat, let me just put it very bluntly to you. Your heartbeat is all that will keep you from God's eternity right now. You ever thought about that? Life is finite, but life is very fragile. I remember many years ago, when I was a boy, my father, our house was next door to the church in Ireland. We had this retired man. He was a very strong man, physically very powerful man. And he was, I think, in the 60s, late 60s. And he physically was so strong that he would cycle ten, five or six miles from his home to the church to dig all the graves that needed digging for the, those who had died. And he would get out his spade and his shovel and his pickaxe, and he would dig those graves six feet down and two feet wide. Now, if you've ever dug a hole in the ground, you'll discover it's not easy work. It's tough work. And to dig down six feet into the ground, plus, is very tough work, let me tell you. You need to be a strong man physically to do that. And he would dig the grave all by himself. And as he would dig the grave, sometimes my brother or I would go over and talk to him. We wouldn't help him because we were pretty lazy, but we would go and talk to him. And I remember one particular incident talking with him about the death of a church member who was about to be buried in the grave that he was digging. And we, we bury people two to three days after they die in Ireland. And I said to him this, and he was looking across the graveyard and he was telling me this, whose grave this was and this was and this one he dug. And I said to him, I wonder who'll be next. I wonder who'll be next. And do you know who the next grave that was dug in the church graveyard was? It was his grave. 
because as he cycled home, went into his house a few, few weeks later and just walked across the yard of his farm, fell down dead with a heart attack. Gone. You know who dug his grave? His three sons came and dug their own father's grave. Oh, life is very fragile, isn't it? The Bible puts it this way. No one knows what a day will bring forth. Nobody, nobody. You can get up in the morning and be healthy and strong and powerful and have great ambitions and desires for that day. And before the sun sets, you could have departed this world and gone out into God's eternity. You say, but what happens if you're young? Well, just go to the graveyards of Singapore. Go up to that Chochukang Cemetery and you'll discover that there are graves there of young people, aren't there? There are graves there of little children, little infants. There are graves there of babies who only made it a few hours into this world. Life is fragile and life is finite. And you know, knowing that is not to be simply morbid, but knowing that is a realistic fact, isn't it? I'm not saying anything here today that's unrealistic. I'm just saying facts. I'm not painting a black picture just to frighten you for the sake of frightening you. I'm painting a picture that's very, very realistic. But then I want you to notice that death is our enemy. But also death brings fear into the hearts of men and women. You notice how it says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You know, an enemy is someone or something that brings fear to the heart of an individual, doesn't it? If we were told today that all the nations round about Singapore had declared war on Singapore, would you be happy about that? Would you say, oh, fantastic, I'm going to war. No, the more powerful the enemy is, it strikes the greater fear, doesn't it? Into the heart of men and of women. And why do we fear death so much? What is it about death that really frightens us? Well, one of the great problems with death is we, we don't know what comes after death. There's no one that has come back from the dead to tell us what it's really like. We fear the uncertainty of death. We fear dying alone. We fear the potential pain that comes with death itself. We fear leaving our loved ones behind. And most of all, we fear meeting God after we die. Oh, death brings a great enemy to your life and my life. It's a great enemy that we have to face down. But here's the good news. You will not fear an enemy if you have someone much more powerful on your side, do you? If you have someone who's far greater than your enemy and you know will destroy your enemy and has destroyed your enemy, then there's no fear of that enemy, is there? But for the unbeliever, he or she, they don't have anyone on their side to deal with the problem of death. And that's why it strikes such fear in their hearts. Listen to what the Bible says about the unbeliever, the non-Christian. It says, there is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. No peace. Deep in their hearts, they have no assurance. Deep in their hearts, there's no real sense of peace to face the future. Yes, they cover that up by getting involved and consumed in things in this life. But every now and then, maybe when they're lying on their bed at night, God begins to talk to them. Maybe their conscience, God speaks through their conscience and says to them, someday, payday. Someday you have to stand before me. Someday you have to give an account to me for your life. And that strikes a cold fear in the heart of the strongest the boldest, the most self-confident. 
And here's the good news. Not only is there a fear of death, but this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, tells us there is power over death. When was death conquered? How can you and I remove the fear of death? You notice in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15, let's go back to that verse again. Because the clue is in that verse. It says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed. Notice it doesn't say, the last enemy that may be destroyed. The last enemy that hopefully can be destroyed. The last enemy, if things go well, can be overcome. No, 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 no. The Bible is absolutely certain here. Because the Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed. Death has met its match. Death has been conquered. Death has been destroyed. But here's the question. Who has conquered it? Who has overcome it? Well, if you go to the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this in verse 54, the end of it. Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, where does that come from, Paul? Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So he's saying, you know, it, it's, death is powerful. So how do we overcome death? How do we deal with the problem of death? Well, here's the answer, verse 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our own efforts. No, that's not what it says next. Here's the next words. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the key to destroying death for you. He is the key for breaking the power of death in your life. He is the key for removing the fear of death for your life. How does he do it? Because he died first. And because he was resurrected. He now has opened the door for you to leave this world in death. Yes, yes, yes. You have to go through death. But it can't hold you. The grave can't keep you anymore. The grave can't destroy you anymore. Because he says this in verse 54. So when this corruptible, this, this corruptible body, and who really wants to keep this old corruptible body we're in? We're all getting older, aren't we? We all wish we were younger and healthier. Unless maybe you are young. Paul says, this old corruptible body which is decaying shall put on incorruption. In other words, we will leave this body behind and we will get a new body, an incorruptible body. A body that you won't need to put on any makeup to make it look nice, ladies. Or buy any of those creams to keep you looking young. It's a body that won't corrupt, won't be distorted by decay, by age, by disease, by death. Because Christ died for you and I, and because he rose from the grave, those of us who are in Christ, having our sins forgiven by Christ, are united to him. And the moment we die on earth, we go straight from this old body into the presence of the Lord. And one day in the future, we just don't know when, there's going to be that great resurrection of the just. And our souls will be united to new bodies. And we will live in eternity forevermore with those new bodies. He's the one. He's the key. He puts it this way in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 15 in, in a very wonderful summary. For as in Adam all die. You and I face death because we are sinners. Where did we get the sin nature from? Our great, 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 grandfather, Adam. You know everybody in this room is related? We're all related to Adam and Eve. 
And because Adam was a sinner, you inherit his sin nature. And because you have a sin nature, you sin. And because you sin, you die. The wages of sin is death. God's justice requires death for sin. That's why everyone in this room has to die. Because we are in Adam. But he says this, here's the good news. For as in Adam all die, even so in who? Christ shall all be made alive. Those who have joined themselves to Christ in salvation will be made alive forevermore. That's why the most famous verse in the Bible, what is it? John 3, 16. What does it say? For God so loved the world. Does that include everybody here? Absolutely. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in what? Him. Him. Should not perish but shall have what? Everlasting life. Now, is everlasting life life that lasts forever or not? Of course it is. If you're united to him, in him, you will be made alive again. You will live for all of eternity. And you'll rise again from the grave with a new body like unto his body. That's the promise. That's how death Death came about, not by us, but by Jesus Christ. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 2, very briefly before we finish out, I just want you to see one verse. The book of Hebrews, towards the end of the Bible, if you don't have a Bible, please share with your neighbor. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So that's talking about why Jesus Christ took on human flesh. Why did he come into this world, the Son of God? Why did he become a man? He took on this flesh. And what did he do it for? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage you know maybe there's someone here this afternoon and that describes you all your lifetime you've been under the bondage of the fear of death now, you may not have thought about it all the time. But throughout your lifetime, there has come moments, epochs, situations, circumstances, where the fear of death has gripped your heart, your soul, your mind. And as you look around you, you, you can't see any solution to it. The graves just keep piling up in Singapore, don't they? If you want a job that lasts in the times of unemployment, become an undertaker because you'll never run out of people to bury. You might run out of people to pay you for the burial, but you won't run out of people to bury. It's always going to have a job. I remember I used to go to this barber in Ireland and he always used to say, there are two jobs you'll never run out of things to do, being a barber or being an undertaker because people's hair never stopped growing and people never stopped dying. There's a bit of career advice for the young people. Oh yeah, you won't run out of graves. Or you won't run out of jobs to do if you're an undertaker. The graves keep piling up. The vigil services keep happening. Death claims another victim. Then another victim. Then another victim. But for the Christian... The victory over death has already been won. Has already been won. We don't have to fear it. We don't have to panic over the thought of death. Because death is simply this for the Christian. 
closing your eyes on earth and opening them into eternity. In less than a millisecond, after you die, you will open your eyes in God's great eternity in a place called heaven. That's why the Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says it's gain. Why is it gain to leave this world? Because you gain a far better life in a far better place the moment you leave this world. That's why death is swallowed up in victory. In fact, Paul put it this way as well. Listen to his words. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. Notice how he puts it. Willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Most of us are not willing. That's the honest truth, isn't it? Most of us are saying, no, no, I want to live another five more years, another ten more years. If I can stretch it to 80, fantastic. If I can push 90, even better. And if I get to 100, wow, I'll feel so good about myself. Paul says, no, no, no. As a Christian, you have the wrong perspective if you think like that. To be absent from this body will take you to a place that's so much better than earth. Who would want to live here a thousand years? It's terrible, isn't it, earth? Just look around you. Just open your newspaper. Just switch on your television. You see all the bloodshed and the hatred and the malice. Go into the office on Monday morning and listen to all the backbiting and the politics and the jealousy. Oh, this world is not a happy place. This world is not a peaceful place. The old Christians, when they buried their dead, they put this sign, a Greek word, above their place of burial. And it's a Greek word that we get our word cemetery from. It's a Greek word koimetria, or metria. Do you know what the word means? Sleeping place, sleeping place. You know what happens when a child falls asleep? The parent says to them, just close your eyes and when you wake up it'll all be well again and really that's what happens as a Christian when you die you just close your eyes and you wake up in God's eternity and here's the wonderful news it all ends well for the Christian death is not the end of the road for the Christian it's just a little bend in the road that takes you out of time, out of this earth, out of this old body that's corrupting into a new body and a new life and a new eternity. That's all death is. But if you're here this afternoon and you're not a Christian, oh, well, it's a different story. It's a different message. You should fear death. You should fear what happens after you die. Life on earth is as good as it'll ever get for you. Because if you leave this world without Jesus Christ, you go out into God's eternity to, not heaven, but to the other place, hell. And if you think life is difficult here on earth, I can promise you this, it's infinitely worse there. It's a place of punishment. It's a place of sorrow. It's a place of separation from the love and mercy of God. And here's the wonderful news. You're not there yet. You're still in the land of the living. You're still the right side of eternity. You don't have to go to hell. If you want to go to hell, what must you do? Just keep on living the way you're living. You'll get there. But if you don't want to go to hell, there is a way to escape. There is one hope, one door. As I said on Friday at the Good Friday service, it can be summed up in three little initials that we teach our children. A, B, C. You remember learning that at school? 
I hope you did. Everyone in this room can understand ABC. What is ABC? Number one, A, acknowledge you're a sinner. Acknowledge you cannot take away your sins by yourself. That's the first step you have to make. Acknowledge your sins. Acknowledge you can't take away your own sins. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ has died for your sins. Believe in your heart that he rose from the dead. Believe his promise that he will be with you and he will come to bring you unto himself. If you believe that in your heart, not just with your lips, you can be a Christian today. And see, confess it with your mouth. Acknowledge it. Say, I'm a Christian. I believe in him. I belong to him. Those are three simple steps that if you're willing to take today, Acknowledge you're a sinner. Acknowledge you cannot see of yourself. Believe in your heart, not just with your lips, that Jesus Christ died for you, rose again from the grave, and is coming back for you. And confess it with your mouth. You can go to heaven. You can get your passport today to heaven. You know when you get your passport from ICA, what do you do? You go down and you... Pick it up. And that passport does what? That guarantees that you are a citizen of this nation. That guarantees wherever you go that everybody knows this person is a Singaporean. No, I don't have one. But you can have a passport for heaven. Guaranteed passport. If you do those three simple things on this Resurrection Sunday, say in your heart and say to the Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Knowledge I cannot take away my sins. And believe from your heart that Jesus Christ truly died for you. Confess it. When we say confess it, we mean live it. Go and live the Christian life. If you're willing to do that, Here's the wonderful news. God is willing to forgive you. There's never been a case in all of human history of a willing sinner and an unwilling Savior. Never been a case. There's never been a case in all of human history of a willing sinner and an unable Savior. Contradiction in terms. He's always willing. He's always able to save a sinner from their sins. And if you're here today and you're willing to really acknowledge that from your heart, he will save you. He will forgive you. And he will break the power of death and the fear of death in your life. That's the good news of the story of Resurrection Sundays. What happens when you die? depends on the decisions you make before you die. You ever thought about that? We have an old expression. Decisions determine destiny. Three days. Decisions determine destiny. And the decision you make on earth determines where you live. There's a little poem on a plaque in Ireland and it just says this. Listen to the words of it. Just four simple lines. It says this, Life is short. Death is sure. Sin the cause. Christ the cure. I like that. That sums it all up, doesn't it? Life is short. Death is sure. Sin is the cause. But Christ is the cure. I say this to you today. Don't waste this opportunity on this Resurrection Sunday to deal with the fear and problem of death in your life. Get to know Christ. Whom to know, as we say, is life eternal. Acknowledge you're a sinner. 
believe in your heart that he died for you and rose from the grave on your behalf and confess him as your Lord and your Savior and you can become a Christian and you can leave this place this afternoon with absolute certainty and assurance that death has been conquered for you once and for all. Let us pray. Before we pray, I just want to offer anyone here the opportunity, if you're not a Christian, to simply pray unto God, and if you want to become a Christian, to pray in your heart this prayer. If you want to become a Christian, just pray these words. O oh God, I know I am a sinner. I acknowledge I cannot take away my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me, that he rose again from the dead. And I want him to come into my heart, wash me from all of my sins. And I want to confess him as my Lord and my Savior. If you want to become a Christian, just simply pray that from your heart. And he has promised, not the church, not even this preacher, he has promised if you pray that from your heart, you can become a child of God and have everlasting life. Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank thee for thy word, a word that brings tremendous comfort to the hearts of every believer in this place. Death has no power over us. Death cannot get the victory over us. Because he lives, we will live again in eternity. Because he rose from the grave as the first fruits of the resurrection. Those of us who are united to him in salvation will also rise from the grave. And we'll be with him in heaven forevermore. Oh, the Resurrection Sunday is wonderful news. It's good news. It's the greatest possible news for us. We pray for those who are not yet Christians. Resurrection Sunday is not good news for them. Because Resurrection Sunday is not something that they have enjoyed the blessings of. Because they are not in Christ. Speak to us. Speak to everyone here. Those of us who are Christians, encourage us and lift up our hearts with thankfulness, joy and peace and assurance to know that, oh, the children of the Lord are on our way to a much better place. That we're going to throw off this old body, this old corruptible body. And we're going to put on a new body without corruption. And we will enjoy the joys of heaven forevermore. Be with us for the remainder of this afternoon. Continue to bear witness in the hearts of each and every one. For we ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.